Okay, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our third annual Lunch and Learn on Diaper Need. My name is Miriam Heyer, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's conversation on behalf of Women Fighting Hunger. Led by Lauren Parisier Weiss, Women Fighting Hunger is an initiative of the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Our volunteer work supports CFBNJ's mission and helps to provide food, help, and hope to our neighbors in need. Each fall, inspired by the National Diaper Need Awareness Week, CFBNJ's Great Big Diaper Drive collects products and funds and hosts education and advocacy events like this one. The goal is to inform and energize our New Jersey communities so that we can all stay up to date and continue to address this important issue. Thank you very much to our online audience for joining us, and we're also going to record today's program. The chat is open if you'd like to say hi or ask a question at any time. We will save some time at the end of our conversation for Q&A. Whether you're hosting a local drive, returning from last year, or just beginning to learn about this enormous challenge, we hope that you'll also check out the Great Big Diaper Drive online. We'll put a link in the chat and celebrate the success of last year's drive. In 2022, CFBNJ's Great Big Diaper Drive brought in more than 250,000 diapers, tens of thousands of wipes, and other necessities for our neighbors in need. It also raised more than $19,000. However, despite this success, there are still an incredible number of people struggling to afford diapers. Today, we're going to talk about why that is and what we can all do to help. We'll hear from Lacey Juro, Director of Government Relations at the National Diaper Bank Network, Karen Light, Executive Director at Interfaith Food Pantry of the Oranges, Dr. Toju Chikeobi, Medical Director of Health Corps Limited and the Health Zone Wellness Initiative NGO, and member of Women Fighting Hunger, <laughs> and finally, CFBNJ's very own Danielle Burgess, Impact Programs Manager at the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Our community comes together every fall, but diaper need is a problem year round, nationally, as well as locally. Um, Lacey, I'm hoping you can start us off with a sense of what diaper need looks like on a national level. Yeah, so diaper need is the lack of a sufficient supply of diapers. And right now, one in two U.S. families are struggling to afford diapers. This number has increased sharply um, since 2010 when a study was conducted that found one in three U.S. families experienced diaper need, which that study was reconfirmed um, in 2017 and a few times thereafter, um, which continue to find that one in three families experienced diaper need. But the National Diaper Bank Network concluded a study, a nationally representative study, this June um, that found that now nearly one in two U.S. families are struggling with this need. Um, at the same time, and not surprisingly, diaper banks like the Community Food Bank of New Jersey are seeing increases in the need in their local communities. During the pandemic, diaper banks saw uh, unprecedented demand for their services, seeing increase in demand from two 200 to 600 um, percent. And we expected that that need to wind down after the pandemic has tapered off. But that certainly is not the case. So diaper need is a result of poverty and families that are experiencing diaper need also experience hunger and food insecurity. They have to cut back on things like utilities. They sometimes struggle to afford rent. Um, but we're also finding now that diaper need cuts across income levels. Diapers are extremely expensive and families are really just one job loss away from experiencing diaper need. So you mentioned, Lacey, that the, the problem is so deeply connected to poverty and to other challenges that people are facing. And I think that that's, that's one reason um, that CFBNJ, for example, uh, being a food bank, has stepped up to help folks uh, obtain the diapers that they need. Um, Danielle, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about CFBNJ's effort and why it's so crucial considering the need in New Jersey. Yeah, um, we have took a stance that uh, we understand that a lot of the people, our neighbors in needs, um, suffer from more than just food poverty. And with that being said, we decided that we have a lot of programs to help them support them further, and one of them being diaper need. As Lacey said, I went from one in three to one in two, and that's a huge increase. Um, and we can expect things like inflation, as well as, you know, 
the cost of rent and cost of living, especially in New Jersey area, to affect this tremendously for our neighbors. So we decided that we have to do something to support and diaper need, it takes billions of dollars to, you know, kind of eradicate. So we do our best to supplement these families. And I know that they are grateful, but they need more. Their families are making hard decisions to say, do I pay for diapers this month? Do I pay for childcare this month? Or do I pay for food this month? And it's hard with the snap cliff and, you know, they can only get $95 for the full month. And, if we've all we've all been to the grocery store and know it's very hard to come out with ninety five dollars worth of groceries, um, so they're really making these tough decisions, and we know that we want to help the families that we have serving in line. So we decided that the diaper bank can support um, this effort, and we are really trying to increase the way we support and understand better from a data driven standpoint what our families are facing and how um, we can help in better ways than maybe just diaper need and what other child care services and things we can do to support. Yeah, so CFBNJ is um, collecting and distributing these very important resources and, and helping people across the full spectrum of, of what they need, um, and then works with pantry partners, right, who are on the front lines and um, really, uh, you know, seeing the not only the magnitude of the need, but the diversity of the need. Um, and that, I think, comes with uh, learning a little bit more about how folks are making those tough decisions. And Karen, I was wondering if you could share some of your experience um, at Interf Inter Interfaith Food Pantry of the Oranges, um, directly serving the families in your community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, because Interfaith Food Pantry of the Oranges is a mouthful, we uh, often go by IFPO. So um, I might be using that in my comments. Um, at the IFPO, when the pandemic first struck, we understood that our clients needed more diapers and it was even harder to get them, not only economically, but but getting out. So um, before the pandemic, we provided our clients with 50 diapers, wipes and ointments each month. It's supplemental, as Danielle said. Um, clients, a baby uses about 250 diapers a month. So we were, we were at the one fifth mark. Um, when the pandemic hit, we went ahead and, and doubled that. So we now give a hundred diapers a month, which is about a case, depending on case sizes, um, plus two packs of wipes and um, a tube of ointment for each baby once, once a month. Um, we have seen the diaper need increase. We're now up to over 400 babies served each month. Um, that's a 30% increase already over last year, 2022, and 2022 over 2021 was a 20%, 27% increase. So we are seeing a tremendous increase in need. Um, because clients can come and pick up diapers once a month, and we're open on Wednesdays, except for the first Wednesday of the month. Um, clients can come any Wednesday that they want. We see 60% of our clients come on that first Wednesday. And that really shows us the need. The first possible day you can get diapers from us, you're coming to pick up your diapers. Um, in addition, um, we know that the 400 plus babies that we serve each month um, range from newborns to three years old. That's our program. Um, and yet we see 80% of our diapers in the larger sizes, sizes four, five, six, and we get requests for sevens. Um, sevens is 41 pounds or more. Um, and your average three-year-old is 31 pounds. So we've asked ourselves, what is, why? Why are we seeing a request for such uh, large diaper sizes? And um, it's really important to us at the IFPO that we treat each client with dignity and respect. When um, someone goes to the supermarket, no one asks you, why are you picking that? Why do you want that? That's not the right one for you. The same thing at our food pantry. Clients come and they ask for a diaper size and we give them the diaper size that they ask for. We don't say you've got, I mean, I know enough experience with diapers that when you see a little baby, size six isn't isn't their you know proper size. Um, we think that the reason that clients go ahead and pick the largest diaper size is that sadly, so sadly, 
they don't have the opportunity to change their baby's diaper each time it's wet. They just don't have that luxury. They don't have that many diapers. So um, by getting the largest diaper you can strap on, on a little baby um, allows for more absorbent material and allows that diaper to last longer. Um, that's why uh, clients come and ask for the largest diaper size. Yeah. And I think uh, serving our community members with dignity and, and yet still trying to understand their needs is, is really critical, especially when we're considering things like diaper need that impact families. And, and, you know, one of the things that we have found at Women Fighting Hunger is that for a lot of us, it's an emotional issue, right? When you hear these stories, when you hear about the depth of the need, I, I have a six month old, so I'm very focused on diapers now. Um, and many of us kind of relate to the stress of being able to care for our families adequately. Um, and, you know, on the call with us, Dr. Toju Chikeobi, I was hoping that you could um, talk a little bit about not only that kind of immediate stress and emotional need that we can all relate to, but also kind of what's at stake, what happens when a child does not have the, the proper supplies um, when it comes to diapers. Okay. Um, so um, diapering an infant, as I mean, you're a mom now, Miriam, so you know this firsthand, um, is a full on parental duty. And it's something that the child cannot do for themselves. This the child cannot do for themselves. So it's really all on the parent. So if for any reason the parent feels that this is something that they are doing inadequately, it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety in that parent or caregiver. What we have found, what the studies have shown, in fact, a 2021 study um, in the Journal of Pediatrics showed that there is a direct link, all right, between frequency of diaper changes and two conditions that we see in babies. Um, so that's on one hand. So there's a, a, an, adverse, an adverse child outcome on one hand but there's also adverse maternal outcomes, which I'll talk about later. But let's start with the child. So two conditions have been directly linked to frequency of diaper changes, all right? The American um, uh, Academy of Dermatology recommends that you change the diaper every one to three hours, okay? So uh, in the first month of life, a baby needs about 12 diapers a day two to four months, about 10 diapers a day, five to eight months, about nine diapers a day, right? And then seven to 12 months, seven diapers and so on, all right? So what you're looking at a tremendous amount of diapers that a child needs in a day. And um, Karen talked about, you know, how much they're able, to, just a fit, they're able to supplement the average family that comes to them, right? And so what happens is that parents who are dealing with diaper need find ways to stretch the diaper use. And the most, the simplest way to do that is not to change it as frequently. So as Karen talked about how they will use the bigger diapers because it is more absorbent. Well, what happens is that because it's more absorbent, it's changed less frequently so it stays on the child longer. The two conditions that um, reduce diaper changing frequency direct, you know, directly impacts are diaper dermatitis and urinary tract infection. Diaper dermatitis is like, an, there is a variety of inflammatory reactions on the skin of the baby's butt and perineal area where the diaper covers that happens because of the contact between, it's an, the moisture from the urine and the feces acts as an irritant on the baby's skin. So even if you use, you know, Karen talked about giving the parents a tube of ointment. So even if you use a barrier method, some sort of ointment there, that is only designed to last a certain amount of time. You know, when you go to the shore and you're out in the sun, how often do they tell you, replenish your sunscreen, you know? So at some point, whatever you put on your skin wears down. And especially if it's an area where there's constant moisture, 
in contact with that area. It needs to be, you know, replenished frequently, that barrier, that ointment that you're putting there, all right? In addition to this, the diaper itself acts as a friction for the, for, on the child's skin. And then because of that occlusion, you know, the diaper is an occlusion. The air doesn't get in in that area because you do it as snugly as possible. So nothing leaks, right? And so that occlusion in itself creates a problem. So it makes it a higher risk for infections, fungal infections, bacterial infections. So diaper dermatitis, if you've ever had poison ivy or had some sort of allergic reaction, something to your skin, you know just how uncomfortable it is. So yes, diaper dermatitis does not have major long-term implications for the baby, but those babies are miserable. They can't scratch down there depending on their age. They're uncomfortable. They're crying. They are in, they are just miserable, you know, and that misery translates to the parents because they know when they take that diaper off and they see the redness down there and the bumps and you know the rashes down there they know that there's a problem here but they feel helpless they feel incompetent because they can do nothing about it all right what the study found is that Reduced frequency of diaper changes leads, is associated with more visits to a healthcare provider for these families, all right? So the second thing I talked about is the urinary tract infection. Now, this is way more serious. The urinary tract infection is one of the more serious bacterial infections that a child under two can have, okay? Particularly serious because it can actually lead to sepsis and other forms of infection in the child's body. But beyond that, urinary tract infections, because if, you know, a lot of us on this call are women, and many of us have had urinary tract infections, right? It is highly uncomfortable. You're wanting to pee every two minutes. It burns when you go. It hurts when you go. It is, it's, you're miserable when you have a urinary tract infection. So you can imagine, by its very nature, babies cannot express the symptoms that they're having, they cannot express. So it really depends on a parent to pick up the signs that there's something going on here, all right? There are no external signs of a urinary tract infection. So a lot of urinary tract infections are missed, okay? The problem with urinary tract infections is that they have short and long-term implications for a child. The long-term complications are serious. We're talking about hypertension, kidney scarring, all right? Kidney failure down the line. If it's a female child, maybe when they're having their own children, it makes them more prone to preeclampsia, all right? So we're talking major long-term implications for these babies, all right? And these two conditions are what we see in babies whose diapers are not changed as frequently as they need to be changed. I'll talk about the maternal on later if I have time to talk about that, the implications of that on the parent, on the caregiver. Yeah. So, you know, what we're talking about here is uh, the impact on individuals and families and also the magnitude, the numbers, right? So, so thinking about what that experience is like for the individual and then how many individuals are really kind of um, struggling with this uh, need and this issue. So when we think about the enormity of the need, um, what are some ways in which each of our kind of organizations or areas are working to help families address uh, the, the enormous diaper need that they face? Um, this is an open question. Uh, what, what are some ways our audiences can gain inspiration from our work? I can speak to um, at the national level, the National Diaper Bank Network, um, we work with more than 300 basic needs banks across the country who work in their individual communities to address the needs. So they're providing diapers, uh, period supplies, and other basic necessities in the instance of the Community Food Bank of New Jersey, food, um, mm -hmm. to really make sure that families have everything that they need to thrive. Um, but we also work to participate and conduct studies so that we can continue that research to really see what's going on um, and including, you know, the work that um, was just mentioned with diaper dermatitis, like those outcomes that result as um, for, for families that are experiencing diaper need are really important for us to understand so we can appropriately respond. And so that's a huge part of our work. 
And then finally, um, we work to advocate for policy change because we believe that um, you, in addition to the incredible work that the nonprofits are doing to address the need, policy has to be um, addressed to really make a, a larger change. As Danielle mentioned, it's going to take billions of dollars to address diaper need, and that is, in fact, the case. So we advocate for policy change to fund diaper banks and provide families um, with stipends to purchase diapers so that we're really looking at how we can directly support families, but also directly support the nonprofit organizations who are working extremely hard, who understand their communities and their community needs um, to address this issue. So we continue that work. And then finally, we work to build coalitions. So in New Jersey, there's a New Jersey coalition of diaper banks who work together to really understand, you know, where are the gaps in the services in the state and how can we better reach um, throughout the state to make sure that all families in New Jersey are, are being uh, served. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Karen. No, Danielle, you go first. <laughs> I was just going to say kind of echoing what Lacey says. Um, Diaper bank need, you know, we're fortunate enough at cfb &J to have, be able to put it in our budget. Um, but as much people know with nonprofits, certain budget funding can, you know, be cut by certain things and um, that can happen. So my suggestion is always uh, donations, things like Great Big Diaper Drive. I have seen an increase of people doing um, for like their birthdays or events, kind of doing drives instead of gifts. And I think that's so amazing. We have these baby bundle kits on our website that kind of gives a guideline of things that babies would need. Um, I also recommend reaching out to your local food pantries. Uh, we will be happy, of course, to distribute, but they are also have specific needs they may need. For example, diaper banks most likely do not give formula. And that is a huge need in the community, but it is an expensive product for us to purchase even at a wholesale price. So it's just something that we can't do, but it's something they need. And Karen mentioned ointment. That's something we don't do at either. That's something that may be needed. I would just say an advocacy, you know, raising awareness, letting people know it's a need. I, I didn't... It makes sense of diaper need, but when I first started, I didn't think about it. When you put it in people's mind to say, hey, did you know one in two families struggle with diaper need? That is like, wow, that, that is a big number. So I think um, advocating and creating awareness is one of the best things you can do. Um, and then finding your local diaper banks, finding your local food pantries, because I don't, of all the food pantries in our network, I don't think any of them say, oh, no, they don't, we don't need diapers. They all want diapers. They all want baby products. Um, so I think that is a great way to kind of create awareness and um, be able to help the need. I'll, I'll go ahead and chime in. Um, so um, just I want to thank the Community Food Bank. We do receive diapers from the Community Food Bank every month. Um, which is wonderful and such a support to our program. We also have other partners that um, provide us monthly and kind donations. And in addition, we spend money. We spend our funds to be able to provide diapers. Um, and there absolutely is diaper need. Before we came on, on air, as it were, I asked Danielle, I'm like, when are the diapers in? Uh, because we just, we all um, need the diapers for our clients. Um, what we do at our food pantry um, is try to make sure that our clients um, are enrolled in the government assistance programs that are right for them. And that helps. We know we're all, all just a part, um, but making sure um, that you're enrolled in SNAP or WIC. Um, I think it's really important, and I know all the panelists know this, but I want to make sure that the audience knows that there is no government assistance programs for diapers. I, mm -hmm. I there just there isn't. So um, we can't help clients enroll in a program that doesn't exist, but we can help them enroll in other programs so that they um, have more income to be able to put toward towards diapers in addition to giving giving them diapers. Um, another thing that I want to a point out is um, as a perfect person of privilege, um, when I needed diapers for my babies, I was able to drive to a big box store and get the economy super.
pack. And when when I did that, first of all, it, you know, it cost whatever fifty dollars, um, which I was able to spend, and it brought my cost of diaper down. Our clients don't have fifty dollars and can't get to a big box store. They most likely are going to their local local store and their corner store. Um, they are buying a smaller pack because they have less income available at the time to buy diapers, which means their cost of per diaper is so much more expensive, um, which is uh, just another moment of sadness for me that the people who need the diapers the most are paying the most per, per diaper. Um, with our diaper program, we are saving our clients at least $50 per month per baby with the diapers plus the ointment plus the wipes that we provide. Um, so we have the the great big diaper drive going on now. Um, it, it's it's twin is the great big period product drive. Um, and a couple of us have bumped into the ways in which uh, this issue specifically affects women. And, um, and also the fact that if you need diapers, you very often also need uh, period products. So Toju, I was wondering if you wanted to tell us a bit more about the impact um, of diaper need on women. And then Karen, I know that your uh, operations are really focused on the fact that these needs are often connected. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, there's actually a study, um, it's a bit of an older study from 2013, but what it showed very clearly was that there was a clear association between diaper dermatitis actually and maternal anxiety. And I kind of talked a little bit about that before. And also it showed that the fact not being able to afford the sufficient supply of diapers for a child causes tremendous pressure on a mother's mental health, all right? Um, diaper needs, specifically as a, a need, has been associated with maternal depressive symptoms, all right? Um, in the study, mothers shared, women shared that they felt judged, all right? And that in itself created feelings of incompetence, um, feelings of shame, all right, because they were unable to provide diapers for their children. You have to understand this, that when a child doesn't have the diapers, they cannot go to child care right. because daycare does not provide free diapers for your baby. So if you don't have diapers, your baby cannot come to child care. If you can't put your child in childcare, you cannot go out to work, all right? If you're stretching diapers and you are not changing your child's diaper at the, you know, the clip, the rate you're supposed to change it, the frequency you're supposed to have for that diaper change, what that does is that, remember I said, increase visits to the hospital to increase healthcare visits. You're taking time off of work. And so what it does is that diaper need translate to maternal anxiety, maternal depression, and real economic insecurity for that family, okay? And so the studies are very clear in the link between diaper need and the mental health of mothers. And what is the, why this should concern us all is because children whose parents manifested a high level of stress or depression are at greater risk of social, emotional, and behavioral problems themselves. You know, so there's their long-term consequences, not just for the mother, but also in the area of mental health and social development for their children. Yeah. Um, so Karen, thinking about how pantries address the the kind of whole family needs, um, what, what are some of the ways that you respond to both diaper need and also other needs that, um, that families may have? Thank you so much. Um, because there is a very high likelihood that someone who has a baby also has a menstruator in their household, um, we make sure that when a client picks up 
diapers, they're also getting a pack of maxi pads. So thank you again to the Community Food Bank um, and Danielle, who makes sure that we get our maxis every month. Um, also, we have other partnerships. And then um, once again, going back to the dignity and respect that's so important to us at our food pantry, um, we we are fortunate enough to be able to purchase um, whatever the, the, the difference is to make sure that um, our first person online and our last person online uh, receives maxis. Um, I should also say, not only do you get maxis if you are picking up diapers, but everybody gets maxis. Um, and um, we now are seeing 700 clients on a, on a distribution day, which is, it's, uh, it's unfathomable and I, help lead the place. I mean, it just is, that's so many clients. That's double the number of clients we saw during before the pandemic. I know one of the other panelists talked about uh, with the pandemic being over, we thought it would go back to the way that it was. Not that that was good, but that's what we expected. And it, it has, it is not. And um, as Danielle said, you know, it is um, the economic pressures and um, inflation um, that's creating that. So, um, we do provide maxi pads. Also, no government assistance program for maxis. Um, no government assistance program for any kind of what we call household need items. Um, for, uh, at our food pantry, we purchase toilet paper. We purchase soap to give out, um, tooth, toothbrushes and toothpaste, um, dish soap, laundry detergent, um, these household things that you would have to buy at the supermarket, but SNAP literally provides food, which is very good, but not all the other things that we're used to getting at the supermarket. So we, um, being a supplemental food pantry, don't expect to uh, completely meet the need of the, of the family and the client, but we hope that we are, are helping to lessen the need and help make ends meet. Yeah. Um, we also mentioned earlier um, how critical it is to both meet these needs and also uh, work to um, reduce them through advocacy and through kind of raising awareness. So one of the main uh, goals of the of the drives that we do uh, with CFBNJ is to make sure that people are aware of this problem, that people stay informed, so that when there is a point at which, you know, you can take action that they've already heard of this problem, that they know that the magnitude of, of the need and they understand that their, their neighbors are in need. Um, so thinking about uh, what advocacy looks like and what trying to influence government programs looks like. Um, Lacey, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, efforts that are underway or up to the minute kind of things that people should remain aware of. Even if you know of this issue kind of over time, um, there's always something uh, kind of current that we should make sure we we understand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And, you know, the big thing in a lot of states is that there are tons of states that are just taxing diapers, which is just horrible because they're basic necessities. They shouldn't be taxed. So in many states, that's, you know, kind of the entryway into working on diaper policy. It's not the case in New Jersey. You all don't tax diapers, which is great. And so, um, you know, in looking at policy change in New Jersey, there is actually a piece of legislation, Assembly Bill 5562. There's a Senate companion bill as well that's um, moved through the Senate. Um, but the Assembly Bill needs to get some traction to continue to move through the process. And so what that bill would do is it would create a stipend for families that are enrolled in Workforce Work First New Jersey um, for both diapers and period supplies. So they would actually have additional money in addition to the stipend that they already receive, uh, specifically for diapers and period supplies. And so and when we're thinking about supporting families, we have these great nonprofits who are supplementing, but they still need help. And so um, that direct stipend would provide an opportunity for families to have a little bit more money to be able to purchase these basic necessities. And one of the things that we see with diaper need is that Unfortunately, families that are experiencing diaper need cannot go to work because they cannot send their children to childcare. And so when we're thinking about programs that are trying to increase um, families to or increase the um, ac work activity of families, we need to make sure that we're giving families everything that they need to actually get to work. And so um, this is one way to do that. And so we, we've actually put together a letter writing campaign um, to try to get attention for the assembly bill. So I believe that was just put in the chat. You All you have to do is enter your name, your 
first name, your last name, and your address, and then it will create a um, letter and it will send it to your assembly members. Um, and so, you know, if there's more uh, letter campaigns that come down the line, we'll have your email, we can let you know so that um, continued action can take place. And then there's also a federal bill uh, that was actually just introduced during National Diaper Need Awareness Week called the End Diaper Need Act. Um, this was introduced by uh, Representative Deloro and Representative Barbara Lee and supported by Representative um, Bonnie Watson Coleman. Um, and then on the Senate side, Senator Tammy Duckworth and Senator Kevin Kramer. So it is bipartisan legislation that would actually provide funding for diaper banks. Um, and so it would also add diapers to uh, HSAs, which are health savings accounts and HRAs. So you'd be allowed to use those accounts to purchase those diapers. Obviously, we know that really only impacts people who have access to those accounts. So it wouldn't help, um, you know, people who are living in poverty who might not have those accounts. But the funding that would be allocated to diaper banks would allow for diaper banks to expand their work and continue to purchase more and more diapers to help their community. So there's also a letter writing campaign for that where you can reach out to um, both your, your senator and your um, representatives and same thing, you just have to fill out that quick form and we're hoping to get some more co-sponsors on that bill so we can get that moving through the process. Um, I do also just wanna say that um, in addition to advocacy efforts, one way to take action is to support your local program that is doing this work. So um, thinking of the Community Food Bank of New Jersey and Karen, your work, um, continue to support these programs because it's so important. Overwhelmingly, diaper banks rely on individual donations and in support of foundations in the business community. Um, and then they require volunteer time to keep their missions moving. And so more support is always needed, whether you can give your time or financially, that's really, really important so that we can continue the efforts in the community. And now more than ever, diaper banks are really needing that support. Yeah. I also, sorry, Miriam. <laughs> I, I also just wanted to say from a CFBJ level and a state of New Jersey level, um, Lacey mentioned a coalition of diaper banks that we have with National Diaper Bank Network. Um, and that is really helpful for us to make sure we are all aware of what's being passed. And CFBNJ, for those who don't know, does, and it's a very small, but we do have an advocacy department that is growing. Um, and as much as we are focusing on food, we are focusing on our other programs, such as SNAP, such as diaper, such as period. So we will start to, when we are a part of these legislation conversations, we will definitely share what we are experiencing and what the status of these bills are um, as we are trying to be more of an advocate, because we know that is really, as Lacey said, what helps make these changes that we need. Yeah. So we have those links in the chat. I think that, you know, um, so many of our community members are always looking for, you know, what can I do right now? I'm thinking about this issue in this moment. This is a great kind of click and go thing, um, send to friends. Um, and really what it does is it makes sure that, you know, the, the more you're kind of aware and informed, uh, the more you can be an ambassador or you can kind of represent the fact that this is a need that people have um, and that we all are trying to work to meet it. Um, so I do want to offer, if anyone has any questions, um, you can put them in the chat and I will share them with our panelists. Um, but in the meantime, I, I wanted to return to this issue that Karen raised, and actually a few of us have mentioned already, about um, serving our community members with dignity, right? And I was wondering if you could all talk a little bit more about what that looks like. So there was already the example of, you know, we don't really ask people why they're choosing something, right? Even the concept of client choice or giving people the chance to exercise agency, um, what does that look like in, in each of our sectors? Um, I know from a medical perspective that one of the things that we really need to do work on with pediatricians, I'm a pediatrician, so I'm a physician, but I'm a pediatrician. So this is actually my wheelhouse, kids and the issues of my wheelhouse. Uh, but one of the things that we need to do more is to educate, as, as physicians, we're trained to pick up, um, you know, signs of the housing problem or the food problem. But generally, we don't 
think about the diaper, how that translates into directly into diaper need. So I think that's an area in which the American Academy of Pediatrics needs to work harder at educating our members. And I believe we are kind of trending in that direction now. I think the other thing that we can do is that, is to educate, at least for personally for me, is to educate our communities. Because um, one of the things that people are people in need who utilize services, one of the things that they value the most is dignity and um just a non-judgmental approach, you know, in the service that we provide to them. And I really think this is an area that those of us who are in the health, you know, vol sorry, volunteer space where we like to give and to serve and to, you know, you know, we're always ready to do good, so to speak, is an area in which we want to grow in because sometimes it's self-serving for us because we do it and we feel good about ourselves for doing it. But it's also we need to focus on how we make the people we are serving feel. And I think that is an area that women fighting hunger, for example, is something we can do. We can do that in our community. We can, as we're educating our community on a platform like this about diaper need, we can also folk, you know, focus some of our discussion on the importance of dignity um, and, um, and just, yeah, for, for, the, for our clients, for our neighbors in need. Yes, how we foster that sense of dignity in them. Yeah, I think um, CFB and J, to Karen's point, just tries to not be too invasive with our questions that are being asked. Um, we need to know the child, we need to know the age, but that's just for data from our standpoint, um, but not asking why you're preparing the size. And also I to to Toji's point about education, I, I think we are realizing fours, fives and sixes and now sevens are our most popular sizes. And what we've learned is the through the pandemic is their uh, parents don't often have time to potty train their kids like they used to. And um, it is hard. And we thought, oh, you're working from home. It should be easier. And that was quite the opposite of what was happening. Um, so we are also looking in education materials of saying, how do we properly communicate effective potty training so they don't have to be in diapers as long? That, you know, seems like, oh, why would we do it like that? But that's because if they're not in diapers as long, they don't have to have that expense of paying for diapers. So to help support the education of potty training, but not, you know, criticizing them for not being able to do so, understanding where they're coming from and meeting them where they are to see how we can help them really helps them understand, okay, this is a better financial decision to try to get them out of diapers, understanding that some kids are incontinence and need diapers due to disabilities, but those who don't, try to get them there and then they don't, for childcare, they don't have to bring diapers and, and things like that. So we're really working on that as well as having our pantries, you know, I would say they're really good with not, you know, uh, discriminating or anything like that, but that is also a big part of it. No discrimination. We also try to have them understand that we call it pantry hopping, which means they'll go to one pantry and then go to another and then go to another um, understanding that they're doing that because there's a need and not because they're being greedy. It's because right. there's a big need and that 50 um, diapers that we're giving may not be able to meet it. So right. we are allowing things like that to happen because we know they're doing it for a reason. Um, and long-term, maybe if diaper needs and we have more legislation and things going on, we can start to dig into that and reduce that. But Right now, we're like, we understand. And if they went to the pantry down the street and they're coming in for diapers, they need it and just, just give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'm add, oh, I, I was just going to add to, you know, on that, we, we hear that on the policy side of things in terms of um, period supply specifically that, you know, a lot of times there's a fear and New Jersey just passed legislation to um, period products in schools, which is a great step, but there's always a lot of fear of students are going to take more than what they need. And, you know, what our response typically is, is 
good. Let them because that means that they truly need it. And so, um, you know, we have to really reduce those those judgments on um, taking more than than what people need, because we know that's just where we're at right now. And until, you know, there's more government funding and, and more support for basic necessities, this is where we're going to remain. So um, unfortunately, nonprofits have to fill the gaps to make sure that everyone has dignity. Um, but this is a really important talking point moving forward to make sure that people understand that people are just really in need right now. So there should be no judgment. Um, Miriam, I see a question in the chat mm -hmm. that's health related. The question is from a Maria Holman said, could there be a correlation to weight issues in terms of asking for a larger diaper size, maybe health issues that are brewing in the child? Um, that's always a possibility because you, we know the whole nation is growing <laughs> uh, in size, and that includes childhood obesity is a problem as well. But I think that's less of the problem in this in this scenario. I think it really is because they're wanting to stretch the diapers. And to what Danielle alluded to um, about, you know, just not being able to potty train you know, the, the, their children, you know, in uh, earlier as, as, as you would like to. And so, yeah, could weight be a problem and it contributing to wanting the larger sizes possibly, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, a low on the lower end of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. Karen, I was wondering if you wanted to add anything about, um, the ways in which kind of overall um, the the uh, IFPO, I'll use the, the acronym IFPO, um, ensures that people feel comfortable and confident and uh, can come to the pantry and, and get what they need. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so we do, we actually have a dignity and respect policy um, that um, we want our whole community to um, abide by and use that as our, our goal. Um, we are powered by volunteers. Um, we are, um, without our volunteers, we, and we have a, a phenomenal working board, but we need an army of volunteers um, to be able to execute, to be able to serve 700 people in a morning. Um, and we, we provide um, our dignity and respect policy so that we're all treating each other as well as also providing it to our, to our clients. Um, that is very important to us. And you can find that on our website. We are orangesfoodpantry.org. Um, and an another example of how we treat clients with dignity and respect, um, we talked before about um, menstrual care products and providing maxis. Um, just as we don't judge who takes um, what size people ask for diapers, we don't ask um, for maxis. Um, we don't know who you have at home that might need um, a maxi pad. Um, and also we know maxi pads are also used as incontinence pads. So even if we um, have a client who we feel sure um, has gone through menopause or is a man, we, we everybody gets maxis um, unless you don't want them. So uh, clients, um, when they come to our food pantry, either walk up. Um, and if you walk up to us, you have the ability to have choice. Um, you can choose not to take those maxi pads. You can choose that you love green beans, but really don't like canned corn. Um, also, um, we provide lots of fresh vegetables and um, uh, fruits. And we last month, we provided eggs twice a month. This month, we're going to provide eggs uh, twice a month and fresh milk. Um, so um, if you walk up, you can you can choose. Uh, you don't like peanut butter or, you know, someone's allergic to peanut butter in your household. You would you would skip that. Um, the other option is to drive up. And uh, when you drive up, um, you then have that added convenience of having a, a drive through experience. It's, it's quicker. Um, but you you know, you get the prepacked set. Um, and you, you, you know, you don't have those choices, but maybe, maybe that makes sense to you. Maybe you need to go ahead and get to work and, you know, choosing, uh, green beans versus, um, you know, mixed vegetables in, in a can or, uh, applesauce versus pears, um, is not as important as, uh, moving on your way. And just to echo the, um, I hadn't heard the term pantry hopping, um, 
I understand exactly what it means. I think it sounds so opportunistic. I would like a, a different term because I think about I think about our clients and um, if you have limited means, um, you also tend to have limited time. So you you've now gone to the supermarket with your SNAP benefits and you've paid some money and used your SNAP benefits, but that's still not enough to meet your family's needs. So now you go to one food pantry, that's not enough. That is a lot of hunting and gathering um, just to make sure that you can put uh, diapers on your baby, um, use a maxi pad so you can go to work and, and, and put some nutritious food on the table. And um, I'm so uh, privileged and, um, it's it's such a great honor for me to to uh, serve as the executive director of the food pantry. But we are asking a tremendous amount of our clients um, in what they we expect them to do. The enrollment in all the the government assistance programs, um, which provide a little but not a, but not enough. Um, so I just that always just strikes me. Yeah. Um, and yet another another reason we need to treat people with dignity and respect is no matter what is going on in the day of our volunteers, it is that much harder for our clients. Right. Absolutely. I also want to say um, the pandemic has opened our eyes to just because somebody comes appearing in a certain way or has certain like a nice car doesn't mean they're not in need. I will never forget when we did a large scale distribution and people were pulling up in Mercedes and Porsches. And um, at the distribution site, the cops were trying to turn them away saying, oh, they don't need it. And we had to have that discussion to say, we don't know that. <laughs> a big pandemic happened and people lost their jobs. People are struggling. You have to let them come through. And I think that's the same with diaper need or um, and period need. It doesn't matter how they're appearing and what designer and what uh, car they're driving. It's about what they're saying they need. And that is what we take at face value, not what they have. Right. Right. I think that's a really important point. Um, and so we have a few links in the chat for you to take action. Um, the great big diaper drive is still happening. Um, and also, you know, we've all talked about it, but just to reiterate, diaper need is a year round problem. So if you can't host a drive in the next couple of weeks, but you really um, feel like you can in the spring or something like that, um, CFBNJ is always happy to have the support. Um, I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us uh, this morning slash afternoon and um, make sure that you keep in touch. Uh, we, we really have an ongoing effort to not only meet the needs of our community, but also increase our advocacy efforts. So thank you again.